So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, one of our second year nephrology fellows here at Vanderbilt, uh, Dr. Anna Hernandez. Uh, Anna did her medical school at the University of Hawaii at the John A. Burns School of Medicine, and she did her residency at the University of Hawaii Internal Medicine Residency Program. And she's now with us here at Vanderbilt. Anna today will be talking to us about SGLT2 inhibition for the peritoneal membrane. Anna, take it away. I would say Hawaii is kind of like European vacation. <laughs> um, okay, thank you, Dr. Alshami. Um, sorry, a little out of breath. Um, didn't want to be late for my own PD conference, but of course I run into car trouble. So I ran over here. So I'm just catching my breath a little bit. Um, but uh, so SGLT2 inhibition for the peritoneal membrane. So the past several years have been pretty exciting for a nephrologist. Um, um, and there have been a couple of new uh, drug, ind drug indications that are effective in slowing the progression of CTD. But as with many therapeutic studies, our dialysis patients are often not included from the study population, so the benefits of these drugs are not clear in our dialysis populations. But I've come across a few preclinical studies um, on the use of these, transport, these glucose transport blockers, such as SGLT2 inhibitors, in our PD patients. Um, and not specifically with regards to preservation of um, any uh, remaining residual kidney function, but um, its effects on the peritoneal membrane. Um, and so the question is, what is what is good for the kidney also good for our um, for the peritoneum in our PD patients? Um, so just a little uh, review about the peritoneum and some of these first few slides are going to be review for all, all of you, but the peritoneal membrane uh, covers the abdominal wall and the intraperitoneal organs. Surface area is about one to two meters square. It's comprised of um, the monolayer of mesothelial cells. Um, this monolayer right here and it lines the submesothelial interst interstitial space. Uh, the submesothelium consists of collagen fibers. It contains fibroblasts, adipose cells, and then of course our blood capillaries and um, lymphatic vessels together with nerves and sparse tissue. Uh, the resident inflammatory cells are usually the macrophages. And you'll recall that the capillary endothelium uh, is considered the main uh, barrier of exchange in PD as per the three pore model. And while uh, the submesothelial sub interstitium is not a barrier unless major fibrosis has occurred. Um, and so this is the three pore model, which is one of the accepted models characterizing solute transport. Uh, this model postulates that um, the major transport barium, again, is the peritoneum and the capillary endothelium of the peritoneal, of the capillaries in the peritoneum. They are the determinants of peritoneal solute and fluid transport from the circulation to the dialysate filled peritoneal cavity. It contains three distinct pores, as you know, the aquaporins or the ultra small pores, which are transcellular pores, the small pores and the large pores, the latter two being intercellular pores within endothelial cell layers. And um, these are size selective um, in restricting solute transport based on the molecular weight of any um, molecules. Aquaporins, as you know, only allow for water transport by way of a crystalline osmotic gradient, um, not necessarily by a hydrostatic pressure gradient. Um, small pores do the majority of the work in PD and mediate the transport of low molecular weight solutes. Large pores, which uh, there are a lot fewer of them, um, allow for passage of uh, higher molecular weight uh, substances like albumin, um, transferrin, your immunoglobulins. Um, 
And as we know, in UF, our ultrafiltration and PD differs from dialysis because it occurs again via an osmotic pressure gradient as opposed to a hydraulic pressure gradient imposed um, by the dialysis machine. And the prototypical osmotic agent, agent is the uh, in peritoneal dialysis that facilitates UF is glucose. Um, so this osmotic gradient allows for fluid removal and middle molecular clearance through convection. And when it comes to ultrafiltration, aquaporins allow for about 40 to 50% of the ultrafiltrate, while small, small pores account for the remaining total ultrafiltration. Um, and um, glucose has its own gradient, so it will diffuse from dialysate to the capillaries via the interendothelial cells, uh, the small pores in this case. Um, and so, an increase in the vascularization of the peritoneum will lead to a rapid glucose transport, a rapid loss of the osmotic gradient, and a loss of ultrafiltration ability. So that, the duration of the dwell, the tonicity of the PD fluid, um, also the lymphatic absorption of fluid all play a role in ultrafiltration capacity. Um, what about ultrafiltration failure in PD? So um, it is the inability to maintain volume homeostasis despite the use of hypertonic dialysate solutions. Um, and after you rule out mechanical problems like catheter dysfunction, uh, leaks, non-compliance, if your patient is just taking in way too much salt or fluid, if there is a loss in residual kidney function, or maybe just that the PDA prescription isn't quite right for the patient, then you're probably dealing with a true ultrafiltration failure. And it's defined as uh, when you use the glucose PET test, and you want to think of the rule of fours for this, um, it's a four hour dwell of 4.25% solution. And a UF volume less than 400 can be used to diagnose ultrafiltration failure. And um, ultrafiltration failure is associated with poor prognostic indicators, volume overload, hypertension, um, increase in left ventricular hypertrophy, poor quality of life, and technique failure in a transition to hemodialysis. Um, at least in early, early on in peritoneal dialysis, this failure can occur most commonly due to kind of the microvascular component of fluid transport that is the water transport through aquaporins um, and that small, small and solute fluid transport across small pores. Um, and so if there's a large effective vascular area that allows for high diffusion um, of rates of small, high diffusion rates of small solutes, this again leads to the rapid disapp disappearance of the osmotic gradient. And this major risk factor, the major risk factor for this is repeated episodes of peritonitis. Um, but other risk factors um, like longer duration on peritoneal dialysis, so years of PD, uh, even in the absence of peritoni peritonitis. And what goes along with this is the chronic exposure of the peritoneum to glucose can lead to a decrease in the effective surface area of the peritoneum which would um, ultimately lead to decreased permeability to both fluid, solute and fluid. So this can be thought of as an acquired ultrafiltration that occurs with time. Um, and so uh, this graph uh, by a study by Davies et al. shows that over time, um, in this case, uh, about four years, the longitudinal changes in solute transport and ultrafiltration for patients who subsequently develop ultrafiltration failure are plotted in these open symbols. Um, and the rest of the cohort is plotted in the closed symbols. It shows that despite having a lower transport status to begin with, let's say over here, um, in the beginning of treatment, these people actually had a significantly worse um, uh, decline in ultrafiltration capacity that was more accelerated over time. Oops, sorry. Okay, that was more accelerated over time compared to the people who had kind of a more stable solute transport status over time. 
And then in this graph, um, another separate study by Davies et al. showed longitudinal changes in the peritoneal solute transport here. And the peritoneal glucose exposure in patients defined as having a stable solute uh, transport status in the um, open um, symbols here and an increase in an increasing solute transport in the closed symbols over here. Um, so you can see here that um, with a change in solute in transport status over time compared to those without a change in transport solute over time, um, these changes were preceded by an increase in peritoneal exposure to hypertonic glucose, um, like at least about two years before you saw uh, this rapid change in solute transport status. So this is supportive evidence that hypertonic solutions may play a causative role in alterations of the peritoneal membrane function over time. So what is it about uh, the prototypical PD fluid that is used? Um, so we're not talking about icodextrin here, but uh, glucose is present at far superphysiologic concentrations um, to establish that crystalloid osmotic gradient to allow for fluid removal. Um, for patients on long-term dialysis, uh, the poor biocompatibility of this fluid meaning the high glucose concentration, perhaps even the low um, pH in these fluids, um, is a major concern because it is cytotoxic to um, the membrane and thus has several drawbacks. So in in vivo and in in vitro studies, uh, they find that the formation of GDPs um, or uh, which occur during heat sterilization of the PD fluid induce fibrosis and vascular changes in the peritoneum. Um, and this leads to uh, the, these GDPs subsequently lead to the appearance of advanced glycos glycosylation end products. Um, and this is accompanied by loss of mesothelial cells, vasculopathy, also known as subendothelial hyalinosis, and narrowing of the vascular lumina. Um, that could even cause obstruction, um, and by an increase in the thickness of the submesothelial fibrous layer. So in this schematic, um, this is kind of a cross-section of the peritoneum during PD. So the left hand here is the um, mesothelial, the epithelial uh, like cell type monolayer of the cells that are attached to the basement membrane. Then there's your submesothelial layer composed of connective tissue, fibroblasts, and vessels. And during PD, um, you have a series of deleterious factors um, in the mesothelium with a consequent um, loss of the brush border, loss of cell-to-cell -cell contact of the structure, detachment of uh, these cells from the basement membrane. And moreover, you have a response to um, cytokines and growth factors. Fibroblasts are activated to myofibroblasts, which increase the extracellular matrix and you get expansion. Um, and in the long term, there is significant damage to the mesothelial uh, layer and mesothelial cells, uh, thus contributing to, again, expansion of the fibrosis. Um, and the inflammatory cells that are called in or, or that are recruited um, also kind of activate a neoangiogenic response. So, uh, mesothelial to mesenchymal transformation or transition um, and fibrosis of the interstitium. Um, during the transition, these mesothelial cells, um, that transition to mesenchymal cells, um, the mesothelial cells lose their uh, epithelial phenotype and they acquire a mesenchymal uh, phenotype. Um, so they begin to express things like alpha smooth muscle actin, which is a marker for a subset of activated fibrogenic cells or myofibroblasts um, that can contribute to fibrosis. And then the vasculopathy, which is characterized again by vessel wall sclerosis and luminal th thinning, as well as an increase in the number of blood vessels in the peritoneum. This is thought to be from deposition of these advanced glycosylation end products. Um, and this is thought to affect the small pore solute transport, uh, which will decrease the capacity via convection. 
Um, but how does this all happen? How does glucose exposure allow for changes in the interstitium? Um, and how does this fibrous interstitium change the osmotic um, uh, gradient and negatively impact ultrafiltration? It kind of implies that there is glucose uptake by the peritoneal membrane, as opposed to just glucose diffusing through the intercellular pores or the small pores. Um, uh, between the clefts of the inter of the um, endothelial cells and capillary membranes, um, and so the schematic representation here of the crystalloid osmotic gradient across um, the peritoneal interstitium in the first few years of PD, um, when there's perhaps only a small amount of fibroblast, um, and then below is the situation where there's long-term PD where the gradient decreases between the peritoneal cavity, cavity and the vas uh, vascular lumen. Um, so the peritoneal cavity lumen is covered with, again, your mesothelial cells and the vascular lumen with your endothelial cells. And these are separated by small pores, which are usually between the um, endothelial cells and aquaporins, which are um, intracellular. Um, the lines show the estimated cut time course of crystalloid osmotic pressure gradient between the dialysate and the peritoneal cavity. And so note that this line remains pretty stable um, across the interstitium um, in the start of PD. Um, this results in a high gradient for the aquaporins to allow free water transport. Um, um, but it this gradient you can see kind of decreases over time in long-term PD due to uptake of glucose by interstitial myofibroblasts, uh, leading to a lower crystalloid osmotic gradient um, and then a decline in um, free water transport. Additionally, um, high levels of intracellular glucose and its metabolism apparently alter the ratio of reduced NADH um, to oxidized NAD+, and this apparently mimics an intracellular state of hypoxia. And this kind of pseudo-hypoxic state promotes uh, fibrosis and angiogenesis. So um, this uh, um, paper by Creed et al. have shown prior studies um, uh, that the expression of glucose transporters are upregulated in interstitial cells in response to this supposed hypoxia. Um, so you get even more of these transporters and more uptake of this glucose leading to kind of a vicious cycle of uh, glucose uptake and fibrosis. Um, and this increased number of glucose transporters reduce uh, the osmotic gradient and thus contribute to ultrafiltration failure. Um, and this is just kind of a summary slide that I found and really liked um, that uh, shows the mechanisms of ultrafiltration after continuous exposure to high concentrations of glucose. Again, you have your formation of advanced glycosylation end products that deposit um, in the interstitium and the capillaries leading to so-called vasculopathy or luminal narrowing of the vessels. You get reduced hydrostatic filtration pressure and reduced small, po small pore fluid transport and thus a reduced uh, fluid transport via convection. And then additionally, the high glucose concentrations mimic a hypoxic state that promotes downstream fibrosis, neo neoangiogenesis, and further glucose uptake through these transporters that ultimately reduce the osmotic gradient and contribute to ultrafiltration failure. And so generally, um, who has looked at glucose transporters in the peritoneum, even just like identifying them? And there have been studies that I saw, I think it was the late 1990s that first uh, uh, looked at or identified glucose transport is in the peritoneum. Um, as you know, generally glucose transport in the body occurs through glucose transporters, and there are two main types, the glutes and the SGLTs. Glutes are primarily <coughs> expressed in enterocytes, um, the intestines, the kidneys, and other organs. And in contrast, SGLT2s 
are restricted to small intestines, our proximal tubules of the kidneys, and um, perhaps even mesangial cells. And SGLT2 inhibitors are, as you know, of great interest because of the various um, clinical applications we now have for them, specifically with cardio and um, renal protective um, outcomes via antifibrotic effects, but also with um, preservation of residual kidney function and urine volume. But there's not a lot of experience or clinical trial data for their use in our dialysis patients. Here is just one preclinical study that have suggested the presence of these transporters in the peritoneum um, by a paper by Schrickner et al. Uh, they found that SGLT2, GLUT1, and GLUT3 are expressed in the peritoneum. Um, protein expression of SGLT2 increases with duration of PD, um, and it's they found that it's significantly enhanced in patients with EPS. Um, and all of these transporters are predominant, predominantly, but not exclusively, uh, located kind of adjacent to the vessel walls of the peritoneum. Otherwise, they're also in the submesothelial space. Um, and so the clinical application of SGLT2 inhibitors in this population becomes apparent. We know SGLT2 inhibition is associated with decreased organ fibrosis, chronic exposure to superphysiologic levels of glucose contribute to changes in the peritoneal membrane that can lead to PD technique failure. And we know how important it is to preserve the integrity of uh, the peritoneal membrane transport status because it is fundamental for long-term success on peritoneal dialysis. And now we know that there are several preclinical pre studies that show that glucose transport transporters are indeed present in the human peritoneal uh, mesothelial cells. And so uh, this is a paper by um, Balzer et al. In, uh, done in Germany, um, and they studied glucose transporters in human and rat mesothelial cells in vivo and in vitro, um, as well as what the effects of inhibition of these transporters, uh, specifically SGLT2, specifically dapagliflozin, um, are on the peritoneal membrane. And so I'm obviously not a basic science researcher, um, so I'll unlikely be able to answer any questions about methodology, but in general, this is kind of what they did to gather their data. Um, uh, what, so they, had, they took human peritoneal cells obtained from PD patients and non-uremic non control patients uh, who were undergoing uh, elective abdominal surgeries for non-renal causes in order to confirm the presence of glucose transporters in the membrane. They had a rat model. So a 12-week-old female mice models were studied. Um, they were exposed to peritoneal dialysis fluid or normal saline um, via a uh, peritoneal catheter for a period of five weeks to kind of simulate a chronic uh, PD mouse model. Um, and then they uh, used apiclofluzin at uh, a dose of one mg per kg um, that was introduced intraperitoneally to um, some of the mouse groups. And then they took tissue samples from the anterior abdominal wall for histologic and immunofluorescent analysis in vitro to look at the morphologic changes in these mouse, mouse models. So these were the general study objectives. Uh, they wanted to look for glucose transport expression in human and mouse models. Um, they wanted to look at the effects of chronic dialysis exposure on these glucose transporters um, with and without um, dapagliflozin. Um, they wanted to look at the effects of dapagliflozin on the morphology and function of the peritoneal membrane. <laughs> And um, they wanted to look at the effects of dapagliflozin on intraperitoneal inflammation, the mesothelial cells, and macrophages. And so we'll start with the results. Um, the top four images are immunofluorescent staining of SGLT1 and 2 in mouse peritoneal membranes. The bottom is um, the human peritoneal membranes. <coughs> 
the top four is um, immunofluorescent staining of mouse peritoneal membrane. So you can see that um, uh, it's stained positively green for SGLT1 and SGLT2. The same antibody was used to identify this in kidney positive controls down here. Um, so it's very apparent. We learned from PATH, if it's green, it's positive. So there's a lot of green. Um, and then in the bottom panels, it shows immunohistologic um, uh, chemistry of SGLT1 and, and IF staining for SGLT2 on the right and peritoneal biopsies of human PD and non-PD patients. So bottom line is based on this, they've established that SGLT1 and SGLT2 are expressed in the peritoneum of mice and humans. Great. Um, and so what does chronic glucose exposure um, uh, do to the peritoneal membrane with regards to these transporters um, that we now know is expressed in humans and mice? Um, additionally, what happens if there is also exposure of inhibitor, such as dapagliflozin? So there, they had four groups of mice, two exposed to saline, two exposed to peritoneal dialysis fluid. Um, and in each group, they, had a, they added dapagliflozin. Um, and so chart B, um, you can see a strong upregulation of SGLT2 in mice receiving peritoneal peritoneal dialysis fluid, but not SGLT1. Um, also in part B, or in, in these two charts, dapagliflozin led to a significant decrease in SGLT2 expression compared to the group of mice receiving PD, uh, peritoneal dialysis fluid without um, dapagliflozin. And then in chart C, we look at the glute trans transporters. Um, P peritoneal dialysis fluid led to an upregulation of GLUT1, uh, 3, but a downregulation in GLUT4. And, and there is no effect on the expression of these transporters when they added the inhibitor. So, based on this, we've learned that peritoneal dialysis fluid leads to an increase in SGLT2 expression. An increase, and this increase in expression is mitigated uh, significantly in the presence of an SGLT2 inhibitor, inhibitor. We also know that there is a differential expression of glute transporters um, in, peritoneal in the presence of peritoneal dialysis fluid. And if an SGLT2 inhibitor is added, there's no change in the expression, which kind of makes sense. You wouldn't expect an SGLT inhibitor to affect necessarily glute transporters. Um, so what about the structural and functional changes in the peritoneal membrane that are seen in that last scenario? So after five weeks of exposure to the dialysis fluid or the saline, they did histologic examination of the membranes. <coughs> um, the top panel uh, here, uh, there is an increase in submesothelial thickness um, in the PDF group compared to the saline group um, and compared to the PDF group plus um, the DAPA group in this scene in the, in the bottom panel. You can kind of see it here as well. So PDF, PDF exposure leads to an increase in thickness and fibrosis. And um, if you add DAPA in, in this group, there seems to be a decrease in um, thickness and fibrosis. Can, and can I interrupt you here for a second? Yes. So is it okay to ask a question now or later on? Normally we do later, but it's okay. 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 Now I was just wondering that it makes sense that DAPA is reducing the fibrosis with less <laughs> exposure, but I'm just wondering how the DAPA is reducing the expression of SGLT2 receptors. Or, uh, not receptors, like the transporters, because DAPA is inhibiting the SGLT2 transporter, but reducing exposure means you are working at the transcription level and how that's working. Only one thing I can think of that reduce glucose exposure is reducing the expression. But, and did you think about that or was there any discussion like about it? 
Um, I do not. So your question is, how does the presence of dapagliflozin reduce the expression of SGLT2 right. receptor? Yeah, exactly. Ex reduced expression means you're having reduced transcription or translation of the protein. Mm -hmm. And DAPA is a transporter inhibitor. Are mm -hmm. you doing something at the epigenetic level that you're reducing the expression? Yeah, so I don't, the paper didn't really go into um, how the expression could be reduced in the presence of dapagliflozin. Um, but I, I mean, I think, it, yeah, it didn't really mention on a transcription level if there was anything like blocking further transcription or there is methylation going on. I don't know that answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like if we are seeing the effect downstream of the um, glucose exposure by inhibition, but I'm just wondering how the upstream is getting affected. Right. right. So I think they kind of just um you know focused on the downstream effects as far as kind of on the genetic level or dna level i don't know okay thank you Anne. um okay and so now in that same scenario they looked at tgf beta a cytokine that allows for the differentiation of fibroblasts to myofibroblasts which promote fibrosis. They looked at the levels of TGF-beta in the effluent of these uh, mouse models. Um, and you can see and see that there is an increase in TGF-beta in the PDF group compared to the saline exposed group with and without DAPA. Um, and, if, um, there, and if you add dapagliflozin in the PDF group, there looks to be a decrease in TGF-beta levels. Um, and then if you look at figure D, where they tried to assess um, intraperitoneal abdominal volume and maybe as a surrogate for ultrafiltration, <coughs> they did this by um, um, recovering the volume after a 120 minute dwell of high glucose uh, containing fluids with a 4.25% solution um, after five weeks of treatment. Um, and so values greater than one indicate ultrafiltration happen and values less than one indicate a net fluid absorption. Uh, so you can see UF significantly decrease in the peritoneal uh, dialysis fluid group alone compared to the other three groups after a long dwell. Not surprising, um, you would expect over time or over a long uh, dwell, you might have some um, net fluid reabsorption. Um, in the presence of dapagliflozin, there seemed to be a less, less of a net UF reabsorption in the group with, PD, with peritoneal dialysis fluid. And this was st statistically significant. And so um, figure E looks at uh, the PET, I guess, by dialysate glucose status, where D is the glucose in the dialysate at time 120 milligrams, and D is the glucose at the dialysis, or in the dialysate at the beginning of the dwell, which you guys know that already. Um, and you'll recall over time, the amount of glucose in the dialysate diffuses into the blood and decreases the glucose concentration in the dialysate. So the lower the D to D naught, the faster the glucose transport is into the blood. And um, the PDF groups had low D to D naught after a long dwell, not that surprising. Um, interestingly though, the D to D naught was not affected by the presence of PDF in, by the presence of DAPA in the PDF groups, which is something I thought we would see, but perhaps not. Sorry, Anna, could, do you mind going back uh, real quick? So in um, uh, graph D, mm -hmm. right? Um, so <coughs> why, why do we think that the addition of DAPA to saline cost us mm -hmm. you well? Yeah. Yeah, I I don't I couldn't figure that out either. The authors just kind of mentioned that hey, this was also a finding, um, but I couldn't find anything in the discussion that could explain that. I'm not. I don't know if that is suggesting that DAPA, regardless of glucose concentration, has some sort of effect on um, ultrafiltration, but that also left me scratching my head. Um, so I, 
I don't know. Yeah. And the, the same thing too for like E, right? The addition of DAPA. Yeah. Really yeah. yeah. So there's there's definitely more to it than what we know so far, but you know, there's there's a lot that we're learning about yeah. about this. So yeah. So we'll it's not um does, does DAPA not... have any osmotic activity? The actual chemical DAPA. Uh I, I couldn't relate to the one milligram per kilogram dose. And uh you know, I'm just asking, is is it osmotically active? Um, that's a good question. I, I didn't read anything about that in the paper. Perhaps that could be an explanation for these findings that we wouldn't necessarily expect. Uh, Osama, I know you tried to get oh. Balzer to come on. <clears throat> Did w Was he able to or any of the other authors were able to? No, unfortunately, we didn't get any any responses. Yeah. Uh, because I think a, you guys have raised a couple of really critical questions. It'd be nice to discuss with the authors. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think what I found going through all of this was, you know, I think we're in the beginning stages of all of this and we're finding new information, but it's not so clean cut and there's a lot more that needs to be teased out. Um, but it is, I think, something exciting. Um, okay. Um, so, what about the what? What about like morphology in geogenesis? So, CD thirty one is thought to be a, a sensitive um, and specific marker for vascular differentiation, um, and we can see here that. Um, peritoneal dialysis fluid upregulates angiogenesis, um, which can in turn affect peritoneal transport status. So A shows the mesothelial layer that is stained with CD31 in mouse peritoneal biopsies. It's a little hard to see, but there is an increase in CD31 positive cells just below the uh, mesothelial layer in the peritoneal dialysis fluid treated mice. So I don't think it shows up very well, but on the paper and on my screen, it is hard to see, but I hope you can kind of take my word for it that there is um, an increase in CD3 and CD31 positive cells in PDF treated mice. And then in part B, um, they had automated counting of microvessels in the submesothelial area. <coughs> um, to kind of confirm the significant increase in vessel density in the peritoneal dialysis fluid groups compared to the saline groups. Um, and there was a trend for a decreased micro, microvascular density in the PDF group that was also exposed to dapagliflozin. Um, now looking at uh, VEGF, both PDF fluid groups had higher levels of VEGF compared to um, the saline groups and the presence of DAPA in PDF group didn't lead to a decrease in VEGF levels like maybe you would think would happen. Um, so perhaps there's maybe a different mechanism to the uh, neoangiogenesis or the increased microvascular density. And DAPA did not lead to a decrease in VEGF levels when it was added. Um, and so now the researchers turned towards looking at the inflammatory response in the intraperitoneal space um, in the presence of peritoneal dialysis fluid with and without SGLT2 inhibition. <laughs> so they looked at cell counts in the effluent after 120 minute dwell of um, PDF uh, exposure by flow cytometry. And uh, chronic exposure compared to saline groups led to a significant increase in cell counts, you can see here. And particularly your leukocytes, including your T cells. TCR is a T cell antigen receptor and thus kind of a marker for T cell activation. Um, your PMNs and your macrophages. And this was not so much the case for your B cells uh, where PDF, uh, the PDF group compared to saline groups had lower B cell counts. And in the presence of dapagliflozin, there was no effect on the leukocytes, the T cells, the B cells. But if you look here, um, there was a reduction in the peritoneal 
I'm sorry, in the PMNs and an increase in the macrophages in the peritoneal dialysis exposed group. So the bottom line is high glucose exposure had sort of differential effects on the cell counts and that addition of dapaglifosin um, specifically seemed to decrease um, PMNs but increase macrophages. And we'll get back to that in a few slides. Um, so when they looked at pro-inflammatory cytokines, so like IL-6, TNF-alpha, um, uh, monocyte chemotractate protein 1 or MCP1, and anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-10, um, this is what they found. And they showed that PDF exposure is associated with a statistically significant increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-6, TNF-alpha, MCP1, compared to the saline groups. Um, and a statistically significant decrease in anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-10. Now, in the presence of dapagliflozin, there was no significant change in, in these uh, pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory uh, levels. And so the bottom line here, glucose leads to increased pro-inflammatory markers and a decrease in anti-inflammatory markers, but DAPA didn't have any effect on this. Just a quick point there, Anna. That I just I mean, I, I don't I don't want to see the p values here for myself, but just the eye test, right? For IL six, I mean, the bar the bar seems much higher for PD fluid plus DAPA, and the same for IL ten, um, and the same for MCP one. These all didn't weren't statistically significantly different from PD fluid alone. Uh, apparently not. <laughs> I don't have the p-values. Um, they, I, um, yeah. I mean, they're they're on the paper, but yes, that was also strange as well. But I kind of just took their word for it. Yeah, right. Because it's, I mean, IL six alone, right? That looks like it's almost triple, right? Uh, the graph is triple the height, but yeah. you're saying there's no difference. It's yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, when I was going through this paper, I was kind of scratching my head a lot, not just because a lot of this is basic science, but <laughs> a lot of the graphs and what they were saying in the text, um, it was hard for me to kind of um, put together because it, it was, it looked like it was kind of showing different things. But <clears throat> Okay. So now that we know that SGLT2 inhibition reduces fibrosis and functional changes in the peritoneum from a few, sl few slides back and had kind of equivocal effects on the inflammatory response in in vivo studies, meaning glucose increases certain leukocytes and pro-inflammatory markers and DAPA seems to attenuate PMNs but increase macrophages and it had no effect on any of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, supposedly. Um, what about SGLT2 inhibition in uh, mesothelial and macrophages in the in vitro setting in mice and humans? Um, so they analyzed omentum-derived mesothelial cells and macrophages in vitro. Um, and part A shows that there is an increase in mRNA expression of SGLT2, not SGLT1, in high glucose concentration environments. Um, it seems that this, um, in high glucose concentrations environments. Yeah. And then in B, they took lysates of these mesothelial cells and macrophages. So they basically just lysed them open and they measured the glucose content in them to determine what the glucose uptake were by these cells in normal and high glucose uh, concentration environments and what the effect of DAPA was on this. So uh, glucose concentrations were increased in the high glucose concentration groups in both cell types, not surprising. Um, so you can see here in both mesothelial cells and in macrophages <coughs> in normal glucose concentrations, Dapagliflozin also significantly decreased intracellular uh, glucose uptake in a dose-dependent manner. In the high glucose concentration groups, the presence of DAPA um, also did this. Um, it, it also reduced the amount of glucose uh, uptake in both mesothelial cells and in macrophages. 
So the effect was seen in both normal and in high uh, glucose settings in both um, mesothelial cells and macrophages. But the top um, observation is opposite of the mouse model, where they saw the decrease in the SGLT2 transcription, like expression. Here they are seeing upregulation. In the top, they are showing an increase in right. SGLT2 and, expression. And in the PD exposure in the mouse model in vivo, they showed decreased expression of the SGLT2. They're showing in, in here? Not here. The previous data you showed in the mouse uh, PDF model, where I had asked, like, how it's reducing the expression. In the in vivo study? Yeah. Yeah. So that is opposite, opposite observation here in the in vitro model. Yeah, I think that this is what you were referring to. Yes, yeah. I mean, the, the, just the point that Dr. Bunsell is, is making is there's a discrepancy between the in right. vivo and the in vitro findings. Yes, yes. Yeah. I agree. Um, <laughs> it does seem to, there is a discrepancy with that, which I, I didn't really know how to explain. I wasn't sure if just the transition from an in vivo and an in vitro model somehow changes these sort of um, findings. Um, um, see. Sorry, Anna, I don't mean to interrupt you. I think what's what's interesting as well is the way that that the data is analyzed, right? So, um, you know, and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about with the inflammatory markers. So even if you look here at, at this slide, so if you look at the graph that's on the top right, you know, so um, the first two bars, there's that dash that says NS, so not statistically significant. And then they compare the three right bars, uh, and then it's still not statistically significant. Then they, when they compare the four, that's when the fourth one becomes statistically significant. But if you go back to the prior slide, Anna, the one with the inflammatory markers, um, uh, the one with the IL-6, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, this one. So if you look at the one at the top left, right, they compared saline to saline and DAPA, and that's not significant. Then they decided to compare the three, saline, saline and DAPA, and PD fluid. And that's when PD fluid became statistically significant. But then when they were looking at PD fluid and DAPA, they only compared PD fluid and DAPA to PD fluid, not compared to the rest, you I know? Think I think that that um, significant that asterisk at the top. I think they were referring to saline and PDF groups only. So I know it bridges over the saline and DAPA, but I when I was reading it, I had a feeling they were just comparing those two groups, the saline and the PDF, both without DAPA. I mean, I I can't disagree with you. I can only go yeah. by what I'm seeing though, right? So what I'm seeing is they're clear about what they're comparing and it seems like it's um, like a chosen comparison. Mm -hmm. I think if, if that line extended across, right, to everybody, then perhaps PDF and DAPA would be different, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah. That's one thing to note, right, when we're looking at statistical analyses. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, and then the Dr. Weinhandel commented in the section saying there are a lot of p values in this paper. I can't help but tune out after a while. Yeah, exactly. I think that that's that's uh, that's on point. I think it becomes right. a little overwhelming. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <clears throat> okay, let me just make sure. So, um, just kind of the last result slide. Um, we know from a few slides ago that high concentration exposure was associated with some elevation in pro-inflammatory markers such as MCP1. Um, and we also learned that there is an increase in macrophages in the PDF in response to high glucose. <coughs> and in in vitro studies of mouse and human mesothelial cells, they top two graphs. Uh, high glucose exposure is again associated with an increase in MCP1. Um, in the setting of high glucose concentrations, the presence of DAPA in, reduced the levels of MCP1 in both human and mouse mesothelial cells, and not so much in the 
normal glucose concentration. And then the opposite seems to happen in macrophages in, in mice models. High glucose concentrations lead to a decrease in MCP1 production compared to the normal glucose concentration levels. And DAPA seem to result in a lower MCP1 level in the normal glucose concentration, um, but had no effect in the high glucose concentration settings. So essentially, mesothelial cells demonstrated dapagliflozin mediated reduction in MCP1 only in the presence of high glucose, whereas macrophages, this reduction was only noticeable in normal glucose concentration. And this may reflect um, what's known as the M1 to M2 switch of macrophages based on environmental cues. In this case, high glucose concentrations may trigger a conversion of M1, which is kind of your pro-inflammatory macrophage to an M2 macrophage, which are considered anti-inflammatory. And these pro-inflammatory cytokines such as MCP1 from M1 macrophages may, re may be reduced if there is more conversion to M2 uh, macrophages. So that kind of tells me that if you're undergoing PD, DAPA is able to decrease pro-inflammatory markers in mesothelial cells, which is great. But even in normal glucose concentrations, at least in macrophages, DAPA is able to exert antifibrotic effects, um, perhaps because DAPA is a stimulus for M1 to M2 conversion, even in the absence of high glucose concentrations. So that's kind of a mouthful, but hopefully you can appreciate that different cells uh, with respect to dapagliflozin can still have beneficial effects uh, regardless of glucose concentration. And that's kind of the, what I took away from that portion of the study. And so there's a lot of data. Some of it is confusing. There's lots to, summar to summarize, but essentially <coughs> SGLT2 is present in mice and human peritoneum, and it's upregulated in the presence of dialysis fluid. Uh, chronic exposure to this play a role in regulation of glucose transporters like GLUT1, 3, 4, and SGLT2. Dapagliflozin reduces fibrosis, and this is accompanied by a decrease in TGF beta levels, which is also associated with an increase in ultrafiltration capacity. And dapagliflozin reduces microvessel density, possibly independent of VEGF. And when it comes to cell counts, dapagliflozin decreases. Um, PMNs, but increases level of macrophages, possibly M2 macrophages. And in vitro studies, lysates of mesothelial and macrophages uh, had um, glucose concentrations are decreased in response to DAPA. And DAPA has an, possibly has antifibrotic effects by way of both mesothelial and macrophages, possibly independent of glucose concentrations. So <clears throat> It sounds like overall a positive study, um, although with a lot of questions. But that's not the only study on this topic. Again, like I mentioned earlier, aside from this study, there are a handful of other preclinical studies that are all pretty recent, and they all kind of had mixed results um, that you can see here. The first three seem to have um, kind of, um, or the first two seem to have kind of positive results, whereas um, this third paper seemed to um, not be able to replicate the findings in the first two um, papers. And then this fourth study actually looked at dual blockade of um, SGLT1 and 2 by an agent called a fluorazin um, that seemed to have some positive effects. Um, but this has a lot of questions, not just in the um, statistical analysis, but like kind of moving forward, what does this all mean? Um, uh, we're, like I said earlier, I think we're also in the very early stages of this. Um, and there are a lot of questions that uh, we have, a lot of things that need to be teased out. For example, like what is the mechanism of SGLT2 in the peritoneal membranes? Because as we know, that this should be accompanied by an influx of sodium, but I couldn't really find anything that mentioned any uh, physio physiology of this um, in the studies. Um, you would think that there would, this would be accompanied by sodium influx, but I didn't really find any papers that mentioned this or looked at this. Um, and then what is the route of administration of these inhibitors in rat models? Some were done by intraperitoneal 
administration, some by like intragastric, which I'm assuming is oral. Um, how would this work in humans? Um, and how would this, how would parenteno glucose uptake look like in diabetic patients? Um, and then as we all know, with the acute decline that we see in GFR when we start our CKD patients on SGLT2s, you know, we, we like seeing this, we know they're gonna have good long-term prognosis, but would this compromise the residual kidney function in our PD patients? Um, and this, as we know, residual kidney function is so important in our patient, in these in this population of patients. Um, so it seems we are still in the beginning stages of glucose transport in the peritoneal membrane. Um, but hopefully down the road, we find yet another indication for SGLT2 inhibitors that would benefit our uh, peritoneal dialysis patients. Um, <clears throat> there, are, there are obviously no clinical trials in humans um, investigating this, but I did find this uh, trial uh, when I was doing some research. It's a phase two study in Denmark with the objective of investigating either the effect investigating the effect and safety of SGLT2 inhibition on glucose uptake in PD patients. And the primary, primary outcomes um, were peritoneal glucose uptake, secondary outcomes being volume, fluid volume UF during PD, uh, plasma and peritoneal fluid glucose levels, and the safety of this all. So, and this is supposed to end sometime in December, so maybe we'll, we'll get to learn more about this in a clinical setting. That's all I have. A very good job, Anna. Like uh, we are all impressed with the breadth and depth of your knowledge in this area as a fellow, which is really hard to see. So congratulations for such a wonderful job. Um, and as you said that, um, like we all saw that there are discrepant findings and there are so many things which does not make sense. And it is kind of obvious because previous papers and uh, other studies are not consistent with these findings. Mm -hmm. And so bigger group is this burgling group, like you see this third, second and third, they had shown that empagliflozin did not do anything. They did mm -hmm. not have a good um, expression mm -hmm. of SGLT2 in the mesothelium. But um, I agree that this is the beginning of the field, like mm -hmm. that storizin, which is non-selective for GLUT transporters. There's mm -hmm. like maybe uh, there's better expression of GLUT transporters and that's mediating. Mm -hmm. um, so we are all keeping tuned with basically like, uh, I know we are having discussion about better fluids without glucose, but we don't see them in the near future. So maybe something to reduce the exposure, like the absorption. So, right. Great job. But I would definitely say like, um, uh, for everyone to read the editorial by Joe, um, Joanne Bargeman and Jason after this Bergman paper. He really uh, summarizes the whole finding very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was really excited when I came across kind of these early preclinical studies, but then as I read through them, um, it just became clear that we are still in the beginning and there's more work to be done by uh, researchers, but I, I, I do think the clinical application is very exciting. And so down the road, hopefully we, we just are able to find a new um, indication for of this drug or a similar drug like the fluorescin for our PD patients. So I want to be mindful of everyone's time, but uh, I think Anna, um, I'd like to echo what everyone's saying in the chat and uh, what Dr. Bunsell just said, I think, you did a fantastic job unpacking a very difficult and dense topic and a paper with a lot of elements and things that were being followed and studied and uh, opposing findings and pro-inflammatory markers seen, no difference in pro-inflammatory markers. Um, it definitely is uh, you know, shedding insight onto something that uh, <laughs> is very important and something that we'll be dealing with with our patients, especially with the increased use of SGLT2 inhibitors in our um, in our nephrology patient population. Um, it's be interesting to also see the long-term clinical outcomes and how they're affected by the prescription of these medications uh, in our patients. But yeah, I think we're left with a lot of questions and unfortunately not enough time to, to go over all of them, but absolutely fantastic job unpacking such a difficult topic, really. Thank you.
All right. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to thank everyone who tuned in for uh, today's uh, conference. I really appreciate everyone's input. And uh, I know I learned a lot. And I'll see you all next month.